Good morning. Is my mic on? I don't know. We got a new one. you're a big fan or if you just if you like the way they sound okay so here's the first one okay Johnny Cash Woo! okay a few um, Bruno Mars <laughs> Hank Williams senior okay, a couple couple Hank Williams jr. Okay. Not very enthusiastic, okay, but there were a few. Um, the weekend. Hmm, hmm. Uh, Lil Nas. People are like, yeah, no, not my thing. Maybe, okay, maybe you just don't want to say it in church, right? I don't like him either, it's okay. Uh, Drake? Oh, really? Really? Now, see, you guys are the younger folks cheering for Drake. You're the same ones that gave us mumble rap and popularized J-pop. I mean, okay, I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, Olivia Rodrigo. Okay, okay. This one will be interesting, all right. Uh, Cardi B? Somebody study the Bible with her. Nirvana? Okay. All right, now I want you guys to see what I just did there. I used to work in the music business, and I worked in the radio business. Uh, we would do profiles on communities where we would have demographic breakdowns of, for a corporation like Intercom or Clear Channel, what is the segment of the population that we can market to and make the most money off of for our advertising dollars? Let's see what people are into and what people like. I just did an experiment with you guys to see what, if I wanted to start my own station and make the most money, I would be hitting the uh, Drake crowd, I think, this morning, uh, more than just about anything. But we all have very strong opinions about music. Uh, a lot of times our opinion about music, what we like the most is whatever was popular for us as a teenager a lot of times. kind of interesting how that works. But we have these opinions. All of us on some level are music lovers. And I would suggest even if you don't listen to music as much as you used to, there's still music that when you sit down and listen to it, you're like, I like this. Okay? I think that's because we're created in the image of God. Okay? And you may not have thought about this before, but God himself is a music lover. Did you guys ever think about that? He's a music lover. He loves it. Matter of fact, he invented it, just like he invented art and so many other things. He's creative. He likes art. He likes music. And while our taste in music may vary generationally, regionally, depending on our mood, depending on the people we spend the most time with, uh, certain things are hits to us. Guys, for God, certain things, certain songs are hits to God as well, okay? There are certain, certain music, certain songs we sing that he really, really likes. But guys, on the flip side of that, and this is very, very important, on the flip side of that, there are songs that God doesn't like at all. And I don't mean songs on the radio or on MTV, which I think there are, okay? But that's not what I'm talking about. I mean songs sung to God. There's songs sung in worship to God where God is like, uh-uh, that's just noise. Look at uh, on your notes in Amos 5.23, which you got some notes in your bulletin. If you want to pull those out, it's going to have uh, most of the scriptures that we're going to look at on there. It's also going to have a place for you to make some notes. 
Um, but in Amos 5.23, God says, through the prophet, away with your hymns of praise, they are mere noise, circled noise, they are mere noise to my ears. I will not listen to your music, no matter how lovely it is. Now here's an example of a group of people who were getting together and singing praise to God, and God's response is, this is just noise. You need to just be quiet. I don't like this sound that's coming from you. Kind of like if you grew up and you had your music playing really loud, and your mom said, turn that down. It's not music. It's noise. Just turn it down. My mom used to say that to me because I listened to rock music loud, okay? God's, it's the same way, only it's not just because of a generational gap, there's something else that's wrong here. And the truth is, because music is God's invention and God loves good music, God loves it when we sing praise to him, but uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why our songs will not be acceptable praise. Um, we're actually starting a new sermon series this week on worship. And so what we're going to look at today is what does not make my song a hit in heaven, and then what does make my song a hit in heaven. So we're just going to have a general kind of overview of what is acceptable and unacceptable worship to God. We're going to look at several passages in Scripture to get those uh, principles from. And then what we're going to do in the coming weeks is we're going to look at uh, a few old hymns. And we're going to talk through the story behind some of those and also the biblical principles that we learned from them. You guys might have noticed we sang Come Now Fount this morning, which some of you, that was the first time you'd ever heard that song. Okay, that's an old uh, hymn. That's one of the ones we're going to look at. and We're going to look at a couple of others. Uh, but just to start out, guys, what does not make my song a hit in heaven? Well, first of all, it's not the tune. Okay, it's not the tune. It doesn't matter how catchy it is. That's not what God is looking for. It's also not the talent. And what I mean by that is it's, it's not about the sound of the voice. It's not about the talent of the person singing. That's not what God is looking for in acceptable worship. It's not the timing. And what we mean when we say, uh, I like the beat of that song, what we're really saying is I like the timing. It's not about the beat. It's not about the timing. And it's also not the type. God's preferences are not limited to a genre. You know, God doesn't look and say, I just like the Christian music. That's the bubble that I live in. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. It's not about genre. What does make my song a hit in heaven? So we're going to draw principles from Colossians 3.16. We're going to look at four hit song essentials from there, okay? So here's going to be the passage we're kind of coming out of for the most part this morning. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Okay, so here are the principles. First of all, my worship is a hit to God when number one, it communicates truth. It communicates truth. Truth. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish with all wisdom. The word teach and admonish there, teach is to share new and useful information. To admonish means to warn or advise about something. With all wisdom means in the wisdom that comes from God. So what he's saying here is to share truth with one another, share advice with one another, share truth about God, wise advice with one another. Song lyrics themselves, when sung to God in songs that honor God, are meant to communicate truths about God. Now, most of you in here are familiar with the story in John 4, where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman. Uh, if you're not... If you read through the Gospels, there is a part in Jesus' story where he's traveling and they were going to have to go around a place called Samaria to get to their next destination. And the disciples of Jesus that were with him were like, hey, we need to go around because we don't go through Samaria. Why didn't they go through Samaria? Because Jews weren't supposed to be around the Samaritans. Now, what happens in that story is Jesus goes right through there. He tells his boys, hey, go into town and get us something to eat. And then Jesus goes and hangs out by the well. And a Samaritan woman comes along 
Now, again, Jews are not supposed to talk to Samaritans. Another thing you might not know is that single men back then weren't supposed to talk to single women at all without accountability because that was considered highly inappropriate. Uh, so if a single woman or a woman comes along by herself. She's not actually single. We'll talk about that in a second. But a, a woman comes along by herself. Jesus is sitting by the well, and Jesus asks her, will you get me some water? Now, what was wrong with that? Well, he talked to her. He wasn't supposed to. But on top of that, and more importantly, she was a Samaritan. Jews weren't supposed to have anything to do with Samaritans. And he was asking her to get him water in a dish that she had touched. Guess what? Jews weren't supposed to touch stuff Samaritans had touched because they were unclean. Okay? And so she gets him a drink of water and then Jesus engages in this conversation with her. <coughs> Suddenly, if you read the story, it's kind of funny. Jesus kind of busts her out a little bit. Because this woman, uh, even among the Samaritan women, was kind of an outcast because of her behavior. She had been sleeping around. She had had five men that she had been with. She was living with a man that she wasn't married to. And Jesus kind of busts her out a little bit. Well, what does she do when she gets busted out in her sin? She changes the subject. She's like, I don't want to talk about relationships anymore. Let's talk about church. Like, well, let's go there. And so she starts talking with him about worship. And she says, you know, you Jews say we are supposed to go down to Jerusalem to worship, but my forefathers say we can go up on this mountain over here and worship. Now, most of you guys, that's not going to mean a whole lot too, but let me tell you something. If you go back and study history, if you study uh, the story of the Jews and the story of what happened, um, way back in Solomon's day, when you guys know Solomon was David's son, right? So David is king. He dies, Solomon becomes king, Solomon dies. After Solomon, his son Rehoboam takes over the kingdom. Rehoboam goes to get coronated. So they go up on this mountain where Rehoboam is going to be coronated, he's going to be made king. People come to him and they say, Rehoboam, you're the new king. You need to understand we are being extremely oppressed by these taxes. There's this burden that's on us. Could you please give us some relief Rehoboam, instead of giving the people relief, gives them the opposite. And he's a real jerk to them. And so guess what those people did? They rebelled. What happened is the southern kingdom by itself, Judah, where the temple was, became kind of isolated. The rest of the tribes, what we would refer to as the northern kingdom, all rallied together around this guy named Jeroboam. And they made him king in Israel. So you had a divided kingdom, a civil war in the, in the God's people, okay? Now, Jeroboam ruled for a couple of years, and what he noticed is because everybody was Jewish, his people that were in his new kingdom kept going down to the temple in, in Judah, down in the south. And so what he did, because he was afraid if people go down to the south, they're going to maybe defect and become part of Rehoboam's kingdom, what he did is he decided to invent a new religion where he actually set up golden calves. Does that sound familiar? Okay. He set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan, two different places. And he told the people, you don't have to go down to the temple anymore. You can go up on these high places and worship these golden calves. In fact, you don't have to repent of sin. Okay? You don't need to live according to this scripture. Matter of fact, a lot of this Bible we're just going to throw out. We're going to keep some of it, but we're going to throw a lot of it out. And you can just go worship around these golden calves. And you can, you can intermarry. You can marry people of other religions. We'll, just, we'll bring them in too. They can bring their idols. And so that was what it became. Okay? Guess where the Samaritans came from? They came from those people who adopted those practices. So whenever Jesus comes and encounters this woman at this well, this is hundreds of years later, after Jeroboam, this woman is still being influenced by this teaching that we can go worship at this place and this place. We don't have to repent of sin. We don't really need to follow these laws. Guys, they even had their own holidays that they celebrated that were instituted by Jeroboam. And so those people had worshipped for hundreds of years, 
what they would say is the God of the Bible, but their practices throughout much of the teaching of, God, of the God of the Bible. They didn't repent of sin or anything. So she comes and says, Jesus, you're saying, your people are saying we still have to go down to that temple to worship, but my forefathers say we go up here and we're just fine. And here's Jesus' response. In verse 23, he says, The time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who worship Him, who will worship Him in that way. Now, that's the context here, guys. What he's saying is, yeah, you guys have this worship that you engage in, but it's not worship that's based in truth. It's not worship that's connected to what God says about himself. You guys are singing songs, but it's not real worship. And guys, why is it important that our songs and our worship be based in truth? Precisely because our songs and our worship is meant to teach. It's meant to communicate truth. Guys, this is why there's there's certain music I don't listen to anymore. Simply because if I consistently listen to it over and over, I'm going to internalize that stuff in my heart. Even if I'm not meaning to, if I just expose myself to it over and over, I'm going to internalize some of that. And I don't want that in my life. And worship isn't simply about feeling. When we're genuinely worshiping, it's not simply this experiential thing. It's not like... Uh, When I go to a a big church that has a light show and and smoke and all that stuff and it's meant to elicit emotion, I can go into an assembly like that and I can can be whipped up emotionally into this experience. But guys, if, if the lyrics and everything aren't based in truth, if we're not communicating truth, it's not really worship. Does that make sense? Okay, it's kind of like the, the Samaritans here. They were going up. Man, they, they were known for their lively worship services. But Jesus is saying that's not worship. That's not worship. In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul writes, here's what I've concluded. I will pray in the spirit, but I'll also pray with my mind engaged. Look at that. I'll pray with my mind engaged. I'll sing rapturous praises in the spirit, but I will also sing with my mind engaged. Okay, what Paul is saying is when we get together, we need to think about the words that we're saying. Whenever we go on autopilot as we sing, which is easy to do, we need to try to guard against that. We need to sing with our mind engaged. As you guys are singing the lyrics to these songs, you might notice some people close their eyes. Okay, the reason is because they're focusing on the words that they're saying. They're freeing themselves from distraction so that they can engage the mind and the heart in this act of worship. As they internalize this truth and repeat this truth about the Lord. Okay, that's a good thing. If we go into autopilot and aren't really thinking about what we're singing, we're not worshiping the way we need to. Something to think about. One of my friends taught me a long time ago to, uh, whenever you engage in worship, he he actually read through Revelation where God is in the throne room. And uh, he said, picture God in the throne room. Picture the angels flying around and picture the thunder and the lightning and just picture his power and his robe and the train is filling up this place It's like you get to sing to him. So whenever you engage in worship to God, just close your eyes, engage your mind, engage your heart, and sing to him. Amen? Number two, my worship will be a hit. Number two, when it connects me to others. My worship will be a hit when, number two, it connects me to others. It says in 16b, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Circle one another. This is a one another passage. If you've never studied the one another passages in the New Testament, it's a rich study. Uh, It's all about how we relate to each other in the church. Um, And this is a very important one. We teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as we sing together. Worship is personal, but it's not private. If you study the New Testament, I can't think of a single instance where somebody was worshiping God by themselves. 
where somebody was worshiping God in song and it wasn't within earshot of someone else. There was somebody that was being ministered to as they were worshiping. It says in Ephesians 5, 16, speak to each other, circle each other, with psalms. You know what a psalm is? It's a song. There's a whole book called Psalms in the Old Testament. It's all songs and prayers. It was the Jews' songbook. Whenever they got together at the temple and sang songs, they were singing out of that book. Okay, that was their hymnal. Speak to each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This is talking about corporate worship. This is talking about getting together as the church and singing together. And here's the thing. We're, we are singing to God, but guys, who needs to be reminded of truth? Does God need to be reminded of truth? Okay. Does God need your pats on the back? You say, God, God said to worship him. Is he like this maniacal, oh, I need them to worship me? No, it's not like that. Why does God command us to worship him? Because we need to be reminded of this truth. We need to be reminded that he's in charge, that he's the best, that everything starts and ends with him. Right? We need to be reminded of that. He doesn't. But God's intention is that we be united in worship together of him. And if you've read the book of Corinthians, you might know worship services in Corinth did not honor God. A big part of the reason they did not honor God is because the people were not together. In Corinth, you had a class of rich people that in their city really didn't treat poor people very well at all. And so in the Christian assembly for a while, you had rich Christians coming in, having a meal, doing it really inappropriately. They were like getting drunk and stuff and taking communion. But then they would wait with the doors locked until the leftovers were all that was left. And then they would open the door and let the poor people in, the poor Christians. Be like, okay, you guys can come in now. We're done. Okay, so they weren't together. And Paul gives them a really strong rebuke. He says, your worship services do more harm than good. I'm certainly not going to praise you for this. I'm told that you can't get along with each other when you worship. And so some people will say worship is between me and God. Well, they're right. There is this vertical aspect of worship. Worship is between you and God. But one of the things you might miss is worship is also horizontal. It, it's you and God vertical, but it's also horizontal, me and my neighbor. Because I'm ministering to my neighbor as I worship as well. It's very important. Now, some people may say, I don't sing good. What God would say is that's okay. Now, when I became a Christian, uh, I was part of a campus ministry down in Florida with my wife, Ariel. It's where we met. But we used to go on Tuesday nights to USF, the University of South Florida. <clears throat> and there would be 60 or 80 of us. Uh, that would get together, we would sing for an hour, and then we would go and have a Bible study after, like a big group. And we had kids from all over campus that would come. It was really a lot of fun. We did it every week. But those Tuesday night gatherings on campus were some of the most passionate worship services that I've been a part of. And guess what? Those kids couldn't sing. And I'm not trying to be mean, but like, a couple times I would go to the bathroom and I'd be coming back from the bathroom down the hall and I would hear them and I'd be like, they sound terrible, right? And, but then I would go into that assembly and guess what I wasn't worried about? They're sounding terrible because guess what they were doing? Man, they were passionately engaged in worship. And there's something to be said about passion, even if you don't sound good. If you get together in a group of people and everybody is passionately worshiping the Lord, even if you don't sound good, it ministers to other people. Because they're like, man, look at that girl. She can't sing, but she sure loves God. Or he can't sing, but he sure loves the Lord. Man, I think I can connect with the Lord here, right? But if they see, the, see you sitting there with your arms folded, that sullen look on your face, like the frozen chosen, Does that minister to them? Like, man, that dude's checked out. Wonder what's wrong with him. You say, but I just don't like to sing. I just don't like to sing. So, think about other people. You may have never thought about it this way, guys. But if you're sitting there saying, I just don't like to sing, okay, are you loving your neighbor? 
Because the Bible seems to indicate here that our singing isn't just about us. It seems to indicate here that our singing is about loving other people. And so the question shouldn't be, do I like to sing? Maybe the question should be, do I love other people the way God says to? What do you think? Think that's a good question to ask when we talk about worship? Because God seems to indicate that it is. And I think we should probably listen to him, don't you? Yeah, let's do that, okay? What are we thinking about? We're seeking to bless those around us. Number three, my worship is a hit to God when number three, it comes from the heart. My worship is a hit to God when number three, it comes from my heart. Just think of your heart as your inner self. Uh, you can think of it as your mind or that inner conversation that you have. It's kind of the same thing in the Bible. Uh, it says in 16, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. Here's something you might not have thought of. When you're singing, but your heart is not right, you can be singing loudly to God. But your heart is not right. God turns the volume down. He turns the volume down. Because it's not worship when our heart's not right. And worship where your inner self is engaged and honoring God is something that, that God really likes. And David, guys, David was not a perfect man. He made some huge mistakes. But one of the things he was generally a pretty good example of is a worshiper of the Lord. He's a man, which a lot of times men struggle with being passionate. King David, a man after God's own heart, was a man who was obviously very passionate. And in Psalm 86, 12, he says, With all my heart I will praise you, O Lord my God. I will give glory to your name forever. With all my heart, I praise you, oh God. This is a guy who got in trouble with his wife one time for dancing too passionately after a battle, right? He was a dude who was, who was man, he just sort of wore his heart on his sleeve sometimes. And he did this in his worship, and God seems to like that. He seems to like that. And I would say, you look at this truth, my heart's going to praise you, I give you glory, Forever and ever. I think the opposite of that is true. If our heart is not praising him, we're not giving him glory. I think that's what we can take away from this. Jesus had some strong words for the Pharisees in the New Testament. The Pharisees were these guys who uh, were very religious. They followed a lot of rules, but they really didn't love other people the way they should because their hearts weren't right with God. Jesus quotes Isaiah, says, These people honor me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It's of no use for them to worship me. Look at that. It's of no use for them to worship me because they didn't have this heart-level connection with God as they were worshiping. And guys, I want to take you back to the throne room again. Mind, heart, inner self. When you're worshiping the Lord, I want you to think about what you're doing and think about these commitments that you've made to follow him. Or if you're just investigating faith, think about how, what that would look like if you did. And sing praise to God from the heart, with your mind and your heart engaged. Be passionate. I want to encourage you to be passionate whenever you engage in worship to the Lord. Okay, How many of you guys are in college? Quite a few in here, right? Uh, have you ever had a professor that's just monotone the whole time? Okay, What does that do to you? You go right to sleep, right? Do you enjoy that class? No, and your professor probably doesn't either. That's why they're monotone. It's probably a research professor in a science class, right? I'm just here for the paycheck. Get me out of here. I want to go do this, right? Um, it's no fun. Guys, worship is the same way. You can go into a church where it's just monotone and it's passionless. That's not going to minister to anyone. But one of the great tools, powerful worship, provides is that it ministers to 
the lost in our community who are looking for connection with God. It's a great tool for ministry. Why? Because you're teaching when you sing. Remember that first point? It's about, we're singing truth, right? You are teaching when you sing. If you're passionless, you're teaching, maybe not about God, but you're teaching others about you. If you're passionless, is this somebody that I can talk to about God? About connecting with Him? Okay? On the flip side, if you are passionate, is this somebody I can talk to about God and how to connect with Him? Yeah, it's like evidence, right? And that brings me to number four. My worship is a hit, number four. My worship is a hit to God when it centers on God. When it centers on God. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. To God. Notice that at the end. To God. Who are we singing to? To God, right? Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. It's about Him. It's not about me or my personal preferences. It's not about that. When we get together and worship the Lord, do I like every single song that we sing? Is that what I would put on repeat in my car? No. But guess what? It doesn't matter. Because it's not about me, it's about him. Okay, now I've got a friend named Robert Cox. Most of you guys in here probably know him. He's got a mother who passed away not terribly long ago, but her name was Miss Aline. Now Miss Aline came from a traditional church. And whenever she would come to our church, she didn't like the worship services. Why? Because it was just too peppy. There's too many happy, clappy people in there, right? She didn't like it. It's too peppy. And so she would come in and she would sing most of the time. But if there was a really peppy song, guess what Miss Aline would do? She would sit down and fold her arms and scowl just to kind of broadcast her disapproval that we needed to settle down a little bit, right? Now, she didn't stay that way the rest of her life, but when she first came around the crossings, that's what she did. She had to grow and develop, right? She didn't stay there, just to be clear. But she did that. Now, one time, early on in her coming to the crossings, she came and sat in her normal spot in the auditorium, and a guest came in, a first-time visitor came in and sat right behind her. Now, Robert was the pre- is the preacher at this church, right? This is his mother that doesn't like to worship sometimes. And so he sees this first-time visitor come and sit behind his mother, and he thinks in himself, to himself, uh-oh, <laughs> wonder what's going to happen here. And so he's kind of watching uh, as the worship service unfolds that day, and the first few songs, she's fine, you know, she gets up, she's singing, but then they get right before the sermon, they get to a really peppy song. And guess what Miss Aline does? She sits down, she folds her arms, and she gets a big scowl on her face. And so he sees that, and he's like, oh, no. But then he sees the visitor behind her. The visitor just loves it. She just keeps clapping, and she's singing, and she's having a good time. So he preaches the sermon, and they get done with church that day. And he goes up and talks to that visitor afterwards just to say hi. And he's like, hey, how you doing? First time here, did you like it? Yeah, I loved it. And I loved how, this is the guest talking now, I loved how everybody in the audience loved it too, except that one lady. She seemed like something was wrong with her. Robert didn't have the heart to tell her that was his mama. And so what he said was, yeah, it's not for everybody. And he moved on. But I I tell you that story to illustrate the point, guys. The way you engage in worship communicates a truth to the people around you that's very, very important. What was Miss Aline's problem? She was centering on what? Her preference. She was centering on her preference in that moment. And guys, again, she didn't stay there. She, she grew to where she didn't do that anymore. But when she first came around, that's what she did. She centered on her preference. What did that communicate to that person who came in looking for God? Something's wrong with this this person here. they're, They're mad about something, right? Is that attractive to somebody that's coming in seeking God? No. 
But what of the other people who were engaged in worship and were happy and passionate communicate to that person who came in seeking God? Man, this is a place where I can find the Lord. Right? It ministered to that person. And so that passionate worship made an impact. But guys, I want you to understand that dispassionate worship made an impact. So you're going to make an impact one way or the other through worship. The question is, are you going to center your focus and thoughts on God Or are you going to focus on, I don't like this song, or I can't sing well, or whatever my personal preference might be that keeps me from singing, or singing passionately, okay? I don't like the way it makes me feel. I feel vulnerable when I sing. Hey, man, you're ministering to people. You're ministering to people. David knew worship was all about God. Again, David's a good example of this, a song of praise by David, Psalms 145, 1 through 3. I will highly praise you, my God the King. I will bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is great. He should be highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. What is that psalm all about? Man, it's all about God. Who's he focused on? He's focused on God. That's where his focus is. Worship on earth that honors God is focused on God. Guess what, guys? Worship in heaven is focused on God. If you read Revelation, each of these living beings had six wings. This is talking about the throne room that I've been alluding to uh, this morning. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. That's worship in heaven. Who is it centered on? It's centered on God. It's not about me. It's not about my preference. Worship the Lord to the Lord is focused on the Lord. It's focused on the Lord. That's worship that honors God. So I just want to encourage you as we sing together to make it about God. Make it about Him. Don't make it about your insecurity. Don't make it about your your fear that you can't sing well. Don't make it about your fear that somebody's going to look at you funny. Don't make it about your fear of anything. Make it about your fear of the Lord that expresses itself in reverence and glory to Him. And watch, guys, as the Lord ministers to a lost world through your passionate singing and worship and praise to God. Watch! Man, we used to go out on campus. Like I said, when I was younger on Tuesdays, you want to know why we reached so many kids in that campus ministry? Because of passionate worship. We would go out in the courtyard, like in public, And worship outside where people were walking by. We didn't even have walls around us. It was weird. But you want to know how many kids came up because they saw us passionately worshiping the Lord. And were like, what are you guys doing? Can I join? You want to know how my wife was reached? Ariel, how were you reached? It was through the Tuesday night meeting. Okay, that was her first point of contact to becoming a Christian because she liked to sing. That's why she came around. And then she brought her friend and that friend and that friend and that friend. And suddenly, man, people like to sing. They're singing praises to the Lord. You can minister to people through passionate worship. You can minister, but we got to make it about God. If if it's about us, if it's about our looking cool, if it's about us putting a a certain image out there, that's not, the focus is in the wrong place. The focus is in the wrong place. So why does God command me to sing to him? We We already said this, but just to reiterate, guys, God doesn't need our songs. He doesn't need it. We need it. God doesn't need it. The world needs it, though, because we're teaching when we sing. We're teaching ourselves, 
We're internalizing these messages ourselves, but then we're sharing these messages with other people as well. Matthew 7, 19-24 is not a passage that's specifically about worship, but it is about focus. And it's, it's applicable here because worship is about focus for you and I. This is Jesus talking in Matthew 7. He says, stop storing up treasures for yourself on earth. If you're storing up treasures for yourself on earth, where's your focus? Okay, you're working. It's all about wealth building. It's all about my career. Okay, there's, there's my God. Whatever's going to help me store up this treasure, whatever's central to my life, there's my God. Okay? Instead, Store up treasures for yourself in heaven, okay? If I move from storing up on earth to storing up in heaven, how is that going to shift what I'm worshiping? How is that going to shift what I'm focused on? How is that going to shift what my life centers around? Dramatically, okay? Dramatically. I'm going to move from idolatry to being a, a worshiper of God. That's a dramatic move. Verse 21, your heart will be where your treasure is. That's something that Jesus repeats. Whatever you treasure the most in life is what you're worshiping. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is unclouded, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how dark it will be. No one can serve two masters. He will hate the first master and love the second, or he will be devoted to the first and despise the second. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay? Now he says the eye is the lamp of the body. What he's saying is that what you choose to desire the most is going to impact the rest of your life. And, you know, we can't choose all of our desires. You guys realize that. I'm an addict. I still want to do drugs sometimes. Now, I haven't, and I'm not going to. I don't plan to, but I still want to. Like, there's certain places that I won't go precisely because I will want to use whatever the people around me are using. Uh, I was a pornography addict for years. Years and years. It took me a long time to make any progress on that sin. Now, I'm not in the habit of looking at pornography anymore, but guess what? If I don't have things in place to keep me from doing that, I will fall right back into that because I still struggle with lust. I still struggle with impure thoughts. I still struggle with all kinds of things. Guess what? I can be impatient. I can speak out of turn. I do all kinds of stuff, guys. If you came over to my house and talked with my kids and my wife, they would tell you, He's, he ain't perfect. He ain't Jesus, right? He does things he shouldn't do sometimes. I'm just being real. But I have these desires that I struggle with. I have these sins that I struggle with. There are certain desires, like my desire to do drugs or to do other things. I wish they would just go away. You know, I really do. I wish I just didn't have them at all. While I may not be able to choose what desires I struggle with, you want to know what I do get to choose? I do get to choose what my greatest desire is going to be. And if my greatest desire is to honor God, to serve Jesus, to be a, a faithful follower of Jesus, if that's really what I choose to make my greatest desire, I'm not going to do this other stuff. And that doesn't mean... <coughs> that those temptations are going to go away completely. I've kind of accepted that at this point. I don't know that I'll ever just be free of temptation. I don't think I will be. Jesus wasn't, okay? I, I don't expect to be. But even though I may not be free from that, guys, I always will have a choice whether I'm going to worship the Lord or not. You want to know what that making that good choice really comes down to? It really does come down to focus. Because the eye is the lamp of the body. What am I going to fill my life up with? Am I going to allow when those things creep into my mind, those temptations, am I going to allow them just to sit there? Am I going to dwell on those? Or am I going to try to flip that and say, no, I want to focus on the Lord. 
I want to call out to Jesus Christ in the midst of this and say, God, deliver me. I want to quote scripture that applies to these temptations because that's God's truth. And so my focus is going to be on his truth and not on this lie that Satan's trying to get me to believe. Okay? You see how that works? Now, I don't do that perfectly, but I'll tell you what, guys. When I'm focused on the Lord the way that I should be, when I'm being a true worshiper, that makes a tremendous difference because what I focus on, I will value. What I focus on, I will value. Number two, what I value, I give my heart to. So he says, whatever your treasure is, your heart's going to follow, your inner self, your inner desires, your inner longings. Guys, you get to choose what your treasure is going to be. You get to choose your greatest desire. Number three, what I give my heart to will control my life. Okay, so this is who you're focused on. This is your inner self. This is that inner conversation that you have with yourself. What do you talk about the most? What do you think about the most? What dominates your life the most? Okay, is it Jesus or is it something else? It's what you give your heart to is going to control your life. And number four, whatever controls my life will determine my destiny. Whatever controls my life will determine my destiny. Why? Because what we focus on is what we worship. What you're looking at, where your focus is going, that's what you're worshiping. And when we learn to consistently honor God, If we can learn to consistently focus on Him, we will have the best lives we can have. Okay? How many of you guys want to have the best life possible? You want to have the best life you can have? You want to know how to have the best life you can have? Jesus. If you can have a great relationship with Jesus, if you can do life the way Jesus says to do it, if you can honor God the way Jesus says to do it, if you can worship God the way Jesus says to do it, guess what? You don't even have to be perfect. You just got to be faithful, which leaves room for you to screw up. Isn't that good news? I screw up sometimes, right? Sometimes I might play basketball and elbow my friend in the face like Craig. By the way, he wasn't here earlier. Hey, Craig, wave. No wave? Oh, there he is. There it is. All right. Yeah, that's the guy who broke Jake's nose. Jake wanted to embarrass you earlier, but you weren't here, so there. I helped it. I helped. You're welcome, Jake. Um, Jesus loves Craig, and Jesus loves you, okay? He loves you, too, and he wants a relationship with you. And I'm serious, guys. We can get caught up in looking for the best life possible outside of the source of the best life possible. That's the American dream, man. Get a job. Get, get, uh, get some wealth together, buy that house, get that picket fence, get that, that wife and those three little kids and that little, you know, that, that, that little picket fence. That's good. You're good, right, man? That's not fulfillment. Fulfillment is only found in Jesus Christ. And you might get some of those other things. You might get some of that other stuff. But, guys, if you look for life outside of the source of life, guess what you're not going to find? You're not going to find it. You want the best life you can have. It really is wrapped up in in honoring God the way God says to honor him. Jeremiah 2.5 is the last passage I want to look at today. It says, this is what the Lord says. This is uh, Jeremiah. God is speaking through Jeremiah. It says, what did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? They worshipped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. Those strong words. That's from God. You want to know who he was talking about? Guess. The people who became the Samaritans. This is specifically talking about the people who got wrapped up in Jeroboam's rebellion where they decided, we're not going to worship God the way he says to worship him. We're going to go do this other thing that we like better. And we're not going to repent of sin. We're not going to get our lives right with God. We're not going to do life the way God says to do it. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to sing some songs to God, 
but we're going to do our own thing. We know best, okay? And what he says in this passage is that they turn to idols, worthless idols, and they became worthless themselves. And that's God saying that, okay? That's strong language right there. What we choose to worship determines our destiny. What we choose to worship determines the, the quality of life that we have, not only in heaven, guys, but here. And so as we engage in this series for the next few weeks, guys, I want to encourage you to take this very, very seriously. And I want our worship to become something that, guys, consistently honors the Lord and ministers to people. And let me tell you something. We can do it. And, and I can tell you a lot of people have come into our assemblies and been ministered to. And so I just want to encourage you in that. I do want to give you an opportunity to respond. We always uh, want to respond when we encounter God's word. And so if you'll open up that bulletin, there's a cardstock piece of paper in there. I want to invite everybody to pull that out, members and guests alike. Um, and... Uh, we want to invite you to respond in whatever way is appropriate for you. If you're just investigating faith, maybe you're interested in learning more. Indicate that on the card here. Uh, if you have been coming to the crossings for a while, but you haven't given your life to the Lord yet, maybe you've uh, just been thinking about that, indicate that you'd like to be baptized. Uh, if you're interested in learning how to join the crossings, uh, indicate that on here. We'll get somebody together with you to talk about that. If you're interested in small groups, uh, which our small group or cell ministry is honestly the best thing we've got going here at the Crossings. Uh, what those are, they're uh, groups that meet throughout the week. We've got adult groups, college groups, teen groups. Um, but we get you together with a group of people that in a smaller setting, it's a lot easier just to get to know your story. It's a lot easier to build friendships. It's a lot easier uh, to meet needs that way. And so if that's something you're interested in, if you're interested in greater community, uh, indicate that on there and we will get you hooked up. Uh, however we can help you, I want to encourage you to respond. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to sing a song that's going to give you time to fill that card out. And then we'll sing one more song after that and uh, we'll dismiss and you can drop those cards in that basket back there, okay? Uh, but I'm excited to get into this series with you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun, so let's pray. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for the gift of, of worship, Lord. Um, I have been so blessed in my life because of the passionate worship that I've seen others engage in, that invited me along. Guys, God, that, uh, a big part of what got me interested to begin with was just witnessing the worship and the passionate connection that people had with you, that love relationship uh, that they have with you. And so uh, I just want to pray, God, as, as we learn about this topic that will apply your truth from Scripture to our lives, uh, that you will help us more and more become a powerful community and force for good here, not because of us and our goodness, but because of you and your goodness. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.